so this is Nathan and uh, Nathan Rossiter's needs analysis for psychology. Uh, Nathan, how are you today? Yeah, uh, I'm doing good. Had a bit of a lion on my two week break. Decent, decent. Um, we'll get straight into questions. Um, obviously, you've been playing to quite a high standard of badminton. Uh, with that comes losses uh, as well as wins. Uh, have you got any sort of like techniques that you use to deal with failure at all? Uh, like losing big competitions in general? Um, I feel for me, part of it is given a lot of it is tournament based, then you might have maybe 64 entries and it'll be straight knockout. So in the first round, half of the people who enter lose and then the next round when there's 32 left half of them lose and by the end of the day there's 63 losers and only one winner um yeah. whereas if i'm playing like a game of five side one team wins one team loses so you lose a lot more often than you win even if you're a really good player um yeah. so it kind of well yeah it is upsetting and stinging to lose and you want to win every single one you enter you understand, given the pool of players, some days if someone's just having a really good day, there's not a lot you can do. Um, is, there, is there anything like with that, say if you are playing well, but there tends to be someone better, is there anything like psychologically that you think that maybe they might have that edge on you? Uh, like in, in, on a psychological sense, like they may have just like the better mentality on the day or? Um, yeah, there are there are definitely some players on the circuit who you know mentally are like they're mentally better at the sport, not because they know more or anything, but just yeah. their approach to it. Um, like no matter how long the game lasts, no matter how brutal it gets, how many games they've played before, you know that they don't have any kind of give up in them. Yeah. Um, it, you know it will be a horrible game before it even starts. Um, Does and that sort of like have a negative effect on you in, in a way? Like, you know, if you're going to have a tough game coming up, do you sort of like you're a bit sceptical of not like preparing for the competition, but just you struggle to build yourself up as you would if you felt like you were more confident to win? Does that have any sort of effect? Yeah, like, like sometimes you'll have, you'll have played a really, really tough game. And then, obviously, playing anyone fresh right at the start of the day, you feel like it's all about who's better. Yeah. Whereas the further through the day you get, it then becomes more about who's better conditioned, who's fitter, who's tougher. Um, and if you've had some particularly hard games and you haven't had a long rest before the next one, and then you're about to come up against someone you know is going to make you stay on court for over an hour, yeah. when you see someone else on the other side of the draw you go oh I could beat both of them easily in about 20 minutes and mm -hmm. you know that as soon as you go a few points ahead they just give up whereas the guy you've got even though you'll probably win he's not going to give up he's going to make it horrible he's going to make you work for every single point and it just kind of it, it saps your energy before you start yeah um that sort of brings me on to my next question really um I was sort of wondering how you deal with fatigue uh, within your performance and are there any like techniques that you use to focus on them um sorry <laughs> are there any sort of like techniques that you use just to wait. um are there any sort of like techniques that you use to like deal with your, your fatigue within your performance yeah so typically as a player i'm more one that like my build isn't good for badminton yeah. so it means that I can play some points really, really fast and kind of outpace people with speed. Yeah. But then I need a little more rest. Like some people are quite thin and slim and they can run and run and run and run, but there's no change of pace. Yeah. Whereas I'm a bit the other way. So I'll take quite a bit of time between points and it almost has a dual effect. In one yeah. way, it then lets me get a rest if I'm, not playing as much as I'm like my time on court if I'm spending more time resting than I am playing the points yeah then I can last as long as the game requires but also because I'm being really slow it then frustrates them um and you 
I think it's between when the shuttle hits the floor and when you start the next point, you have 30 seconds. So you finish the most of that. But yeah, it like a lot of people, as soon as it finishes, they pick up the shuttle, they walk over and then they serve. And they don't use close to the 30 seconds. And a lot of people don't even know that it exists as an official rule. Because the rule is like play has to be continuous. Yeah. But it's it just means within like you need to do you can't take longer than that 30 seconds. Um yeah. so you're well within it, your is right. Is that something that you that use? Time. Is that something you, you have to your advantage? Yeah. I use it a lot. Like I will. I will milk it as much as I can after a point to take a rest because I know if I can go out at the next point and have recovered that extra 10, 15%, then it's more like playing from fresh at the start of the day. And then it means that I have the upper hand against them because of my style of play. Um, is, so uh, it, yeah, that, that, was, that, that added that with the straight sense, jump yeah. really, um, really is a very big factor. Yeah. Um, do you feel like you get wound up at all during performances by opponents um, or say like time waste, not time wasting, but mm. sort of like game management such as that. Do you feel like that yeah. affects you at all? There's sometimes if you're playing and I'm sure you will have experienced it before. If you play in a match and then there's some guy with possibly the worst technique ever and he looks like he's falling over his feet and yeah. but then somehow he's getting past players and he's scoring yeah. and you go, how on earth is he doing this? Yeah, it's, all, it's any- almost how yeah. being so unorthodox, no one's used to it, even though it's not the norm. Yeah. They're like, and well, how I it should be done, yeah. Those players frustrate you more than good players. Even yeah. if they're technically a good player because they're winning and getting good performances, if I'm playing someone who technically... I feel like they're quite poor and that I'm a lot better than, but they just kind of keep running around and getting everything back. Yeah. It can be really, really frustrating because you feel like you should win the point more easily. You don't feel like you should have to put that much effort in. And then they do things that you just don't expect because it looks unorthodox. And then they just win a point out of nowhere. And you think I've put all this effort into trying to win this point. And then they've just mishit it like that. And they've won the point. How do you deal Um, with that in a motivational sense? Um, I try and if that's happening and I notice that I'm getting frustrated, then I try and bring the game to a very, very boring style. So rather than trying to play with any skill and giving them a chance to do something like that, the, the fact that they're unorthodox often means that when they're pushed for time, they'll make mistakes because they're using the wrong technique. Yeah. Like the, the correct techniques exist for that very reason. Yeah. So if I'm trying to play with skill and then they're doing that and it's annoying me, then instead it almost is like the dimensions of the court are irrelevant because I'm just going to hit everything straight at them as yeah. like hard and fast as I can because then it means they don't have the time to like move to the shuttle and do something weird. Like it's it's at them and they just have to yeah. they just have to react. And a lot of players don't play very well reactively. Yeah. They might get one lucky shot off, but not if every shot is reactive. So okay. like that's something that I kind of it took me a bit of time. It's maybe in the last two years that I realized that that was quite an effective way to combat that. But I I did used to get very, very frustrated with that. Um and it was when I was doing some psychology last year um that i really kind of came through on that and it doesn't seem to get to me as much anymore uh, w- w- with that was that through that was through university wasn't it your psychology mm, yeah so you, through Alan. You, you said you mentioned previously um you've had some some sort of psychologist work with you uh, in terms of uh, your sport and performance was there anything that they sort of focused on uh like specifically um I mean, quite a bit what we do is because at that point I had like tournament, tournament, tournament each week. Yeah. I'd almost something would happen and I wouldn't understand why I'd have reacted like I did. 
So like with these players who are unorthodox, I'd get really frustrated and I didn't know why. But after the game, I was like, even though I won, I got really like angry it, like in the game yeah. when normally I'm very calm. So like I, I didn't understand it. So normally I'd come back and I'd kind of talk to her about kind of what happened and she'd get me to kind of like self-reflect on it quite a bit. Yeah. Um, Cause we found if I vocalize something, then I'd start understanding it more. But if I tried to be really descriptive about what was going on, then I'd kind of notice, Oh, that was a trigger for why this happened. Patterns, Cause right. I'd start seeing yeah. patterns. Yeah. Okay. Um, so sort of moving on to, obviously you mentioned playing against unorthodox uh, players and players that sort of frustrate you uh, within performance imagine you've got to have some sort of critical thinking within game time to sort of like come up with solutions do you use any sort of like i know from my own personal experiences i i'm very like i'm an advocate for imagery and visualization of like imagining something that's going to happen or something that i should have done as like a means of review i use visualization quite frequently is that something that Mm. sort of like you'd use in the build-up to competition, uh, you'd use within competition, and then you'd use as sort of like a review. Would you use, is that something you'd say? Or would yeah, you say I'd say time use I it? use that quite a lot. Um, within, within the rally, given it's so fast paced, it's quite hard to do it properly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, it happens a lot in doubles because you have to serve at the start it has to be so like pinpoint, like if it isn't, you're at a big disadvantage. And if it is, you have a big advantage. So there's a lot of pressure on it. And I found as I'm like getting ready to serve, I'll be really, really visualizing exactly how I want the shot to fly, exactly what I think it's gonna do, where it's gonna land. And also I'll be trying to visualize what I think that they're gonna do. Because yeah. if I have a strong picture in my head of this is where they're going to return it, then it really helps with me then being prepared to deal with that and kind of getting on it really fast. Yeah. And if you can yeah. predict it well, then you you win the point basically because they can't, because you've read what they're going to do, you're on it so fast that they then can't react to that because it's in such like a short space giving you so close. Um it can happen a lot of yes, singles yes. too. Yeah, if you like serve it out wide rather than to the middle, it's a bit weird. You're not really meant to do it because it gives them a lot of angles to use. But if you do it and you kind of predict that they're going to do a certain thing and use the fact that they're going to try and by you going wide, they think oh, I can get you here and they reactively play a shot. But you know that's what they're going to do. So you use that information to know that they're only going to hit it to that one place. Yeah. And then you can just intercept that. And then they get really annoyed at themselves because they're like, he's seen this coming. And then it gets them in their own head as well. Yeah, so it, it yeah. can become a psychological weapon almost rather than just being to win one point. So a lot so, of visualization yeah. will be going on at the start of rallies, but the play is a bit too fast in the middle to... Yeah. Use it a lot like in retrospect after you can think through oh i wish that had gone with this kind of flight and then that would open this and yeah so you can yeah. after the fact yeah um is, is that something that is just sort of like come naturally to you in the sense of like you've practiced it over time and it's sort of got a bit more clearer as you've moved on or is that something you've actually had to like work on rather than just be like a gradual process um I found you can work on it, but there's no kind of way of replicating it the same as you would in a game. Because the pressure of a game and knowing that if you do mess it up, that you've lost the point. Like it, I mean, in training, we do play a lot of games. So (laughs) you are are technically practicing it when you play those games. And a lot of people go into games and training and just think, oh, I'm just playing a game but I'll often go in with a bit of a focus in mind of I'm trying to do this when I'm playing today, or I'm trying to do that. And not I won't tell anyone that that's what I'm doing, but some days I will go, I'm going to serve it like this and try and predict what they're going to do. And 
the more you play the same kind of people, the more you get used to where they're going to hit it and you do build yeah. up that prediction and then that lets you train it. And then when it happens, you start to see the little things against other people, like the, sim like the similarities and the way they return it off a serve. And then you kind of, you almost know what they're going to do because you've trained with someone who does something similar. Yeah. So yeah. you can practice it and it is something that you build up a lot through repetition, but it's a very, it's a very feeling based thing. Like yeah. wouldn't some players you can say, oh, here you go, like practice doing this and they can do hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and eventually get good at it. But there are some players who are just good at it straight away just because they have quite an intuitive feeling of how they're swinging without looking at the shuttle. And it, like, it's too fast for you to like look at it and then like hit. You just yeah. have to like play your serve and then you just like react and hit. And you've not even like, you've not looked, you've not moved, you've just, you, you can just like kinesthetically feel yeah. where is the right place to be swinging. So do you think that it has sort of like it has the ability that when you sort of like notice a situation's occurring that it's easy to deal with that in a sense? So I know like from, from my own experiences of obviously different sport with football, I know that say like the right sided midfielder's got the ball, I'll mm. constantly be looking around to see what like where players are in terms of their attacking position to my defensive players' positions. You can sort of like recognise where like a real threat is going to be, so you sort of like adjust mm -hmm. to that. Is that something that mm -hmm. you feel like something's very sort of like important within badminton? Is a sense for you? Yeah, you can you can definitely see danger coming a few shots ahead. Yeah, whether it's because they're really strong in a certain area, like you know, if you let them play a net shot, they're not net shot's going to be so good that you can't lift it all the way to the back. And then they're getting to smash it from closer forward. And even if you can block it over, they're then close enough after they're smashed that they can move to the net really quick from your block and then kill it. And it's like, it's a few shots away, but you know it's coming. And it's like a pattern that you're trying to think, how do I break it? But because of how good their shot quality is, you just have to react and get it over. Like you can't do something different. So you have to preemptively go, I can't give them the net here. I, instead of playing one that loops over the net, you have to play it flatter into court so that they have to then give you the net. And like, there's a lot of times when they like certain players can do certain things and you have to recognize fast in the match within the first maybe like five, 10 points. That's something they're very good at if you don't know them. Yeah. It's often yeah. players who can recognize that kind of thing fast and see, okay, they're strong in this area they're the players who tend to do a lot better when it's unknown against unknown. Um, so it is, a, yeah, it's a big thing trying to predict that danger. But at the same time, you can use it as a weapon against them because if they, you know they're so dangerous somewhere, you know they want to do that. And then you don't have to worry about the whole court anymore. You only have to worry about where they're trying to play because you know they want to play it there. So you can give it them on purpose, knowing they'll try it, but because you're ready for it, then you catch them. Yeah. So yeah. quite a good way of doing it is in singles, if you serve into court, so rather than serving it to the line at the front, if you like serve it so it goes all the way to them so they don't have to move, they then play quite a fast like drive. They hit it hard, like straight at you, hoping that you'll like panic and like float it up in the air because you don't have time, but you've served it there knowing that they want to do that and then you step onto their shot. And like, there's quite a few different ways you can use it um, to really catch people out because um, they think that they have a weapon, but because you know they want it, you use it and then their weapon isn't good anymore because they're there going, oh no, he's going to do this if I ever do that. So it can like neutralize them by giving yeah. them what they want if you expect it. Yeah, so you sort of like, you, you, plan, you know what they're doing, you, you've already got the solution for it, it's sort of like. Yeah, so like if you, see. you had someone running down that wing, as you say, looking to put that cross in, yeah, or to put like a big through ball in from like the halfway line, then if your defender knows that's about to come, he and drops kind off of or puts in that line, line yeah. either drops off to catch them offside or puts in that, 
big shoulder barge like early on in the match yeah. and crunches yeah. that like short skillful attacker and then the attacker's yeah. thinking oh i don't want to be tangling with him again and like yeah. permanently for the rest of the match you're living in his head rent free just because yeah. you like <laughs> i see that danger coming crunch him early let him know you're there like that's what they always say when you're like 10 yeah. years old playing football let him yeah. know you're there early <laughs> on like yeah um yeah it's definitely very very relevant um mm. i think like the only sort of like couple more points i've got to go on i know that um sam irons are uh, sort of performance analysis uh you, you mentioned about i think it was uh, backhand round the corner a, a shot mm -hmm. like that um and it's quite interesting he's actually looked into that and and your sort of point that you made about it being a, a weak area is sort of like come to fruition like it's it's statistically mm. proven um yeah is that something i, I imagine that you've recognized from analysis but then also within game is that something that can wind you up a bit if you know that you should be doing it but you don't mm. is there something like any any sort of like way that you try to like counteract that and deal with that at all yeah, so if I'm, if I know I have a run of tournaments coming up or if I've had a lot of training going on and like if I've got a lot of time to work on things, then I'll put quite a bit of time into practicing rather than like turning and hitting that backhand. Yeah. You instead, your men are like, turn your feet and go like round the head. Yeah. So you still play like a forearm shot facing forward but you kind of, you turn your body and hit it like that from that corner rather yeah. than turning yeah. and hitting it like that. Okay. And I'll do quite a bit of training just practicing like the footwork to get back to that corner because they're quite specific footwork patterns. Yeah, we've, and yeah, not we've that, yeah. yeah when, when you play, you don't think, you just do. And yeah. if I've not practiced the patterns a lot, then I just do the backhand one. Yeah, because I did it so much as a kid, and it was so. It was a big weapon as a kid because no one else could play backhands like I could. Yeah. But then, when everyone got older, then you want to be playing round the head because, when, like, when you're a kid, the court's so big. If you can keep getting the shuttle back, people can't beat you. And yeah, there's people would be play errors to the backhand. Like that, yeah. yeah, they play to the backhand because they go, "You can't clear it," so then they get a short clear. Yeah. And then they just play a smash from mid-court and they win the point. So being able to clear from there, people couldn't win the point. So it was a big weapon. But now, people can win the point without needing the half-court lift. So it's more like if I'm going in the back-hand corner, I'm just being slower because it's yeah. slower and you can't see where you're hitting because you're back to the court. So you want to go around the head because it gives you the option to attack as well. Um, it, I can practice it for maybe like... 20 minutes and then play a tournament and I'm doing it because I've built up the like footwork but it's just like yeah, the memory yeah it's re-putting it in because I've got it so ingrained in me to do it the other way from years and years and years yeah. and it's trying to break that because I've got the bad habit built um so I, I can change it but if I don't have a lot of time if the tournament's not very like high profile then you almost focus on different things. But let's say I'm playing an international and they have training courts that you can use and you're only playing one match every like two days, then mm. I'll be putting the time in to do the really tiny things. Yeah. Um, okay. So it, it is very, very frustrating. Um, but at the same time, if I, I can just go around the head without practicing it, but then the shots I play are really low quality and I'll just lose the point from not yeah. playing them for years. So I have to practice playing the shots and getting like a rhythm with the shots before I then can actually use it effectively. So that, that's the biggest issue with it. It's yeah. getting the amount of hours in. To get through it and keep that, so it's sort of like muscle memory. So keep yeah. that as a, like a, as a pattern of your footwork and movement to keep it as effective as it can be. Um, mm. I, feel like I don't want to keep you too long. I feel like my only last question is just on needs analysis uh, for psychology. Is there anything like if you could pick out a main area, it's like a weakness for your psychological aspect of your sport or, or for your own performance. Uh, it could be like 
losing points in competition that you find a weak area. Uh, say if you've used the wrong technique, you find like you struggle. And say like you said, with um, you get into people's head with uh, management of your timing. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything that you feel like you really, really struggle with that might need to be developed? If there was one thing. Um, I'd say, and it's... I, I know it's a tricky one to get because it's something that I've struggled with in the past. Um, but getting getting the drive to want to do the all the extra little small things. Okay. So sure. like if let's say I'm playing a big run of tournaments, you get the fitness just from playing tournaments. Yeah. But right now I've not been playing tournaments or anything. And if I want to get fit, it's go on runs, like do workouts. It's not like there's really no training great. going on. Yeah. And I am happy to like work out and do weights and things, but it's getting the motivation and the drive to do the cardio, like running. I've never yeah. been a good runner. Um, and it's being able to like every day or every other day go, I know I need to run if I want to be good. And I know how much difference it'll make. Yeah, but it's it's actually being like, do I want to do that or not? And sometimes I will like I'll go through a big phase of having the drive, but then you lose the drive. And if you have tournaments, then you get the drive because you know I've got something coming up. Something to like, up to, yeah, yeah, and you have a goal. Whereas it's you could almost say it's it could be classed as not setting myself goals that I deem worthy enough for that drive yeah so like right now i wouldn't say i've got any goals other than lose a bit of weight and get fit yeah and like that's so, not significant enough of a goal for me to be putting in a maximum amount of effort yeah um yeah. whereas if it was like oh nationals is coming up in two months time and i want to play really well then i'd be out there running every day yeah. um so I I say it's effectively goal it's the it's, it's effectively like goal setting in a time of no goals like coming yeah. to me C creating a mo motivational climate as well in a way yeah. like you actually want to work where it's not just like a you have to work in a, in a way to, mm. so I feel like if you if you just have to put the work in you're not going to put the entire effort in, but if you actually want to be there, then it's obviously going to have more an effect on the outcome of that. Um, yeah. So yeah, that, that, that's, yeah. that's um, right. I do have, perfect. I'll have time, if I build up a rhythm of it, like if I do it back to back to back each day, yeah, then I can do it. But I find as soon as I take even one day off, even if my body's like hurting, it's better for me to not take the day off than to take the day off. Because if I take the day off, then I don't do it the next day. Or if I suddenly become busy for a few days because of, let's say, like lockdown, yeah. easing up and things like that, and I suddenly have a few plans, then it's, oh, I don't have time to do that today. And then the next day, it doesn't get done. So yeah, I, I, I over all of like December and January, I worked out every single day. Yeah. And it's like, it's not something that I saw as like a chore. It's just something that I did. It was just part of the day. Whereas as yeah, soon as have it. Yeah. as soon as I started doing other things like placement, it's oh I don't have as much time in my day. I'm a bit tired, and then working out every day disappears because it's just not part of the routine anymore. So I can do it if it becomes a routine, and I can do it with ease. But it's when getting it's, it's that, not and getting back into it. Yeah, it's, okay. it's getting the drive to go. Oh, I want to establish that routine. That's a worthy use of my time right now. Yeah. Okay. That's, uh, that, that's perfect. Um, actually, got some very interesting points I can look back through there and use for uh, your development plan on the psychological side. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, I'll end the recording now if I can.